Once around, WOH G64. What a name for a star. But really, this is a story all about stellar evolution caught in action, something that we don't really get to see very often. So this star, 16, uh, sorry, 160,000 light years away from us in the large Magellanic cloud, the dwarf galaxy that orbits around the Milky Way, visible from the Southern Hemisphere. There's this marvelous photograph here. You can see dead center, the large Magellanic cloud, and up to its right, its smaller, more distant cousin, the small Magellanic cloud viewed over these telescopes here. And inset is the image that has been obtained that is really causing all the interest in this bizarrely named star. So WOH G64 was actually discovered back in the 1970s by Westerlund, Olander and Hedin, hence the WOH, their initials, and is part of a catalogue of giant stars in the Large Magellanic Cloud. You can see on the top left there that uh, it has been picked out in detail and an artist's impression of what we might be dealing with up at the top right. A dust disk was discovered using infrared uh, astronomy in 1986, and this is blocking about three quarters of the visible light of the star from reaching us, revealing that actually we were lucky to see it at all because uh, it's been dimmed down by a factor of four and is much more luminous than we thought it was. So what is the nature of the star? Well, it's a red supergiant, a massive star in the very last stages before it will explode as a supernova. 40 times the mass of the sun, surface temperature 3,200 Kelvin, so red hot, and putting out 600,000 times the power that our sun does over an area of 3,000 times the radius. So the area would be pi r squared, of course, hence the, uh, the numbers work out. And this was at the time a record for the largest known star. Now, the image that I showed you at the beginning there was made by the VLTI, the Very Large Telescope Array in Chile, acting as an interferometer using their gravity instrument. And it's the first close up picture of a star outside the Milky Way. We've been able to use this technique of interferometry to make images of stars like Betelgeuse and other giant stars in the Milky Way and even stars like Capella. But this one is so much further away being in the large Magellanic cloud. And what we're looking at is the star in the center with a dusty envelope. There's a bright oval in the center and a fainter set of elliptical rings or loops around it. So we think that that uh, dust envelope contains at least three and perhaps as much as nine solar masses of material that's being carried out by the stellar wind. And it's probably losing about one solar mass every 2000 years, which sounds slow, but it's actually extraordinarily rapid. It's the highest known mass loss rate, even for uh, red supergiants that tend to do this a lot. And we can also tell that we're looking at the pole. We're looking down on the rotational pole. The angle of view of the dust disks uh, is making that fairly clear. But that's also responsible for the fact that we were actually overestimating the star's brightness a little bit because we were adding in the light coming from the disks of dust as well, in particular that central oval. So it's been downclassed a little bit to 282,000 uh, times as bright as our sun and having a mass of only 25, not 40 solar masses uh, with a radius of 1,730 times the mass of the sun. But interestingly, we've seen what I said to uh, in the title slide, stellar evolution in action. And we can tell that from the light curve. 
This is from the Ogol experiment, and you can see the purple trace of how bright the star was back from uh, the early 2000s up to date. And up until around about 2014, it was oscillating in a fairly regular pattern, something that we see, a, a regular pulsation in brightness of these uh, red supergiant stars. And then that went away and was replaced by a rather more erratic uh, and uh, irregular pattern that you can see in the right-hand part of the graph there. Not only did the brightness change, but the spectrum changed as well. And we can see that in the brown trace at the bottom, the spectrum of the light from 2007. And then after the transition in 2014, we're looking at the top two traces, 2019 in blue, 2021 in purple, which are both fairly similar. And the spectrum has just changed completely. Something happened. And what has in fact, we think, occurred is that it has changed from being a red supergiant or even a red hypergiant up at the top right hand corner of the Hertzsprung Russell diagram, even redder than Betelgeuse there, and moved over towards the yellow part of the spectrum. So the surface temperature is hotter, and therefore we're getting more of the higher frequency light shifting the color from the low frequency red into that middle frequency yellow part of the spectrum. And we think it has shrunk as well. Size has reduced from about 1,700 times the radius of the sun down to about half that, 800. And so now what we're looking at is a yellow hypergiant. Now this is very unusual. We all just don't see, we don't get the chance to catch in modern times stars moving from one spectral class to another. So this yellow hypergiant, we now think that it has a companion star. Follow-up studies have shown that the spectrum of light coming from it contains hints, not only of the yellow star, but of a smaller blue-white B-type companion. And that perhaps what's going on here is that the B-type companion is stripping away the loosely held outer layers of the star. So the outer layers of that red supergiant were being removed by the gravity of its companion, making the companion build an accretion disk and boosting its mass at the expense of its much larger neighbor. And having removed those outer layers, we've now exposed the hotter inner structure within, hence the yellow color. So the companion is a B brackets E class star, which is not to be confused with a B E star. And that's another whole story about how the different classifications. So the B brackets E class have distinctive emission lines of things like iron and other elements. And these are coming from their outer low density envelopes. And it's probably the result of material having been pulled over from the companion star that's now a yellow hypergiant. So again, that symbiotic relationship, the gravity of the small star has been pulling material over, exposing the deeper, warmer layers. So all of the red hot material of the main star has been removed, stripped away and pulled onto the smaller companion. And uh, we're now seeing the inner, hotter, smaller, denser layers of the main star. Another possibility is that it's just the effect of the stellar super wind, that very high uh, wind that these stars give. But perhaps all of this is explaining why we're seeing that very, very high mass loss rate from the star itself. So a fascinating object. 
And just uh, to add something else into this talk, I also came across this guy, Westerland 1W26. And Westerland, the W of the initials of the original star, WOHG64, that we were talking about, was responsible for cataloging a lot of these giant stars. And this one is in the constellation of Ara and is one of the largest and most luminous stars known. And you can see the cluster Westerland 1 that contains W26 there in the picture. If you zoom in up into the inset in the top right, the little bars are marking where W26 is. And W26 is another of these cool red supergiant stars, originally estimated to be putting out over a million times the power of our sun and be 2,500 times the radius. That's enormous. It would go right out to the orbit of Jupiter. But again, there's so much dust around that the view we are getting from it is being dimmed by a factor of 100,000 times. And that dust is the result of the huge mass loss that this star is also putting out. So it's quite probable that this too will undergo the same sort of transition and become yellower and turn into a yellow hypergiant again. So this one is definitely one to watch. And it seems that we are beginning to be able to anticipate and see stellar evolution in action. Now, that's something that I thought I would never see in my lifetime. I thought the stars were essentially so long lived and unchanging that uh, it would be uh, many generations into the future before we were able to catch this sort of event. But it seems if you look at the right ones, that that's not so. So I hope you've enjoyed that trip around these evolving stars. Thanks very much for listening.